the Apostle Paul had been enmeshed in uh, persecution, turmoil, and we see his writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 9, when he said to them that a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. And there were, in fact, many adversaries that Paul and Peter and John and other apostles and preachers of the gospel had to endure in the first century. And yet it's amazing that as Paul is writing to the Corinthians here, he mentions the fact there are adversaries to the gospel and that he faced as he preached the gospel, but the Lord provided doors to him. And he took advantage of those. And he continued preaching and teaching the gospel. Jesus Christ is pictured as the door in the 10th chapter of the book of John. In Troas, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 12, that a door was opened unto me of the Lord. The Lord provided that door. And the figure of a door is used many, many times in the Scriptures, and especially as we see in the New Testament, where it represents an opportunity. And so when you see then that Paul says, there were doors opened unto me, the Lord was providing opportunities for him. Opportunities to serve, opportunities to present the gospel to the lost, to work among those who were the heathen who had absolutely no desire no inclination whatsoever to even listen to the message of the gospel of Christ. But Paul continued pressing on. He came to Antioch, both he and Barnabas, and when they came to Antioch, they rehearsed unto the leaders of the congregation everything that the Lord had done with them among the Gentiles. And he mentions the fact that the Lord had provided a door of faith unto the Gentiles. Those who were looked down upon by the Jewish people, those whom the Jews believed had no right even to hear the gospel. And yet, the Lord provided that door of opportunity. And we also are to understand from all of these scriptures that even today, the Lord provides for us doors of opportunity. And just as Paul and Peter and the others took advantage of these doors and went through them, and took advantage of those opportunities that the Lord provided for them to be able to reach the, preach the gospel and reach others with the gospel, we also must take advantage of these doors that the Lord provides even today. And here's the thing about it. You don't really have to look for those doors. They're very evident. Day in and day out as we live our lives for Christ, allowing the light of our Christ-like influence to shine brightly. Yes, there are opportunities each day. And for just a few moments, I would like for us to consider a number of these doors that God has provided for us today. First of all, the door of instruction is opened. God's design has always been that men come to Him through the door of instruction, through learning of Him, through learning of His will, and what He would have them to do in order to be saved, and in order to one day enjoy heaven as our home. Jesus invited people to come to him even then, and he continues to do so today through his word. As he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and 
Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Note this, the only way that men can come to Christ is to learn of him. Well, that means that without learning, no one can come to him. Without learning, no one can obey him because they willingly have turned away from him and have no clue as to what to do to obey him. They have to be willing to learn. Jesus said, Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me, John 6 and 45. So there must be learning. And here's the thing about this door of instruction, the opportunity to learn. God has decreed that this door of instruction be opened unto all men. It makes no difference who they are. It makes no difference what their station in life is. They're subject to the gospel. Jesus commissioned his apostles in Matthew 28 and 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, Mark's account, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Into all the world, to all Nations to every nationality of people, you better believe it. Because you see, Paul said in Romans 1 and verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone. Note that the gospel of Christ is all inclusive in that every accountable human being is subject to it. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Yes, the gospel was first presented to the Jewish people, but it was never intended to be exclusively for them. Because we see in Acts 10 that through the working of God, Peter was able to preach the gospel to Cornelius, who became the very first Gentile convert. So the gospel went to the Gentiles. It's no wonder that the elders to whom Paul and Barnabas were speaking, the leaders of the church, were excited over the fact that the gospel was now being preached to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 14. Because that's the way that God intended it. Well, not only does one come to Christ through this door of instruction, it is also through this same door that were provided opportunities to grow in Christ. Because the Lord does expect us to grow. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Peter writes in 2 Peter 3 and 18. Paul came to Ephesus, he preached the gospel, and the powerful gospel of Christ converted people who had that willing mind, that open mind, and so we read in Acts 19 that mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. The church was established there in Ephesus. Paul became very close to the Ephesians, to the Ephesian elders, and he was speaking to them in Acts chapter 20. And before he parted from them, he said in verse 32, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, listen to him, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. Yes, this word builds us up. It strengthens us. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, Paul says, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. And he goes on and he lists the various parts of the Christian armor. But he also writes of the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is what strengthens us. You want to be a strong child of God, a strong Christian? Spend time in this book. Read it. Read it again. Meditate upon it. Make application of it to your life. And you'll be strong 
in the sight of God. Paul told the Colossians, As ye have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, being built up and, and rooted, established in the faith. Listen, as ye have been taught. Colossians 2, verses 6 and 7. They were taught. That's how they were built up. That's how they were rooted and grounded in Christ. They were taught. They learned. And we read of the early Christians in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. It's no wonder that the church of Christ in the first century, where the Roman Empire was concerned, the church of Christ in the first century proved to be a force to be reckoned with. Turning the world upside down, Acts 17 and 6. Because the gospel was preached, people listened to it, people obeyed it. The early Christians continued in the apostles' doctrine, that is their teaching, as they were inspired men of God. They were built up, they were rooted in Christ, they were strong. And when they became strong, they were going to do great things for Christ. Same is true with us today. When we become strong in the faith, when you and I become strong individually, the only way we can do that is spend time with the book. When we become strong individually, then our families are going to become strong. And then as we have strong families and we make up a congregation, the congregation itself is going to be strong. And with the help of God, we'll do great things for Him. But then... Secondly, the door of salvation is opened. Yes, when an individual comes to Christ through the door of instruction and learns what he needs to do, then there's this other door now that is open. And he has to go through that door. The Bible tells us how to do that. The paramount purpose for which Jesus came into the world is stated by Paul in 1 Timothy 1 and 15. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, to save the lost. Jesus stated his mission very clearly in Luke 19 and 10, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why he came. Men were lost and dying in sin. They needed a Savior. So Christ came. And he sacrificed his own his life on the cross so that men could have the opportunity to be saved. And then the gospel was preached. Peter and the other apostles made it known to those whom they preached that in salvation there is none, there is no salvation separate and apart from the name of Christ. Acts 4 and verse 12. One has to be obedient. And Jesus is that door. He said, I am the door of the sheep. John chapter 10 and verse 9. In John 3 and verse 16, Jesus says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You notice that word, whosoever? That's exactly what it means whosoever, whoever comes to believe in Christ can obey Him and obtain salvation. He came into His own, and His own received Him not. But as many as received Him, to them gave He the power or the right to become sons of God. John chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. And so only by coming to Him through obedience, doing what He says, can a person obtain salvation. And here again, this door of salvation is open for all. Every accountable human being is subject to the message of the gospel of Christ. In Romans chapter 3, starting with 23, Paul says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, listen to him, through faith in his blood. Through faith in his blood. So it's no wonder 
that Paul said in Romans 1.16, the gospel is God's power to save. Why? Because you have the blood of Christ involved. Jesus instituted his memorial supper in Matthew chapter 26 and in verse 28 he said, for this is my blood of the New Testament which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Paul writes in Ephesians 1 and verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, we've been redeemed not with, the, not with corruptible things, the silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You see, the, the blood of animals offered back in the Old Testament period through the Levitical priesthood couldn't take away sin. And the writer makes that point in Hebrews 10 and verse 4. It simply was not possible, he says. But the blood of the Lamb of God could take away sin. John pointed to Christ in John 1.29 and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That blood can and does remove sin. But what do you do? Well, you have to come through the door of salvation. Jesus says he is the door. Well, listen to Acts chapter 2 and you find that response in beginning in Acts 2 and, and repeated numerous times throughout the book of Acts. You see the response of sinners to the gospel. In Acts 2.37, people are pricked in their heart. They ask the question, what shall we do? Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. What did they do? Well, those who were receptive, those who, were, those who had an open mind, those who wanted to be saved, those who gladly received his word were baptized. Acts 2.41. And then, in Acts chapter 8, Stephen is over in Samaria preaching the gospel. People are obeying. They believe Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Christ. They're baptized, both men and women. He joins himself to the chariot of the Ethiopian nobleman, teaches the gospel to him, and the eunuch says, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? He obeys the Lord. Paul goes over to, uh, uh, to Philippi, and, and he's put in jail, he and, he and Silas. And then... A little bit later on, he teaches the, the jailer. The jailer obeys the gospel. And on and on it goes. That's the response to the gospel. This is how Paul pictures it in Romans chapter 6, starting with verse 3. He says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. The like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. What's happening? Well, the old man of sin dies. The Bible calls it repentance. And then... And then, you know, after a death, there has to be a burial. That's what Paul writes about in Romans 6, 3, and 4. You're buried with Christ in baptism. But then, just as Christ was raised from the dead, with us obtaining new life in Christ, there also has to be a resurrection. So we're raised with Him to walk in newness of life. Romans 6, 4. That's the response of those who went through this door, the door of salvation. And then finally, there's the door of service. Now, this logically comes next, doesn't it? When an individual comes up from that watery grave of baptism, now there's another door presented, and that's the door of service. You see, the church exists to serve. Paul makes this point that through the will of God they serve for his good pleasure 
in Philippians 2 and verse 13 in the American Standard. Both to will and to work according to the good pleasure of God. Now, as far as Christians are concerned, this is what we need to know. Paul wrote to the Romans, and he said to them in Romans chapter, chapter 12 and verse 1, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So, Christians don't lie down on that altar of sacrifice that we read about back in the Old Testament period and allow someone to physically take our lives. No, we live for the Lord. Jesus died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 15. So there's a life of service that begins. We read in Titus 3 and verse 1, Be ready unto every good work. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Always abounding in the work of the Lord. He writes to the Ephesians in Ephesians 2 and 10, We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, listen to this, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. That's what Christianity is. It's a life of work. It's a life of service. Paul says in Galatians 6 and 10, as we have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto those who are of the household of faith. We are to be mindful of the needs of others, always willing to, to serve others and to help others. That's one thing he told the, the uh, the Galatians, in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13. Their responsibility was to serve one another because that's what Christianity is. Well, when you think about this, what kind of life we're to live, what we're, what we're to do, who is our example but Jesus Christ himself? yes. He's the one that shows us how to do it. Jesus taught his disciples what to do. He taught them about service. He taught them how they are to respond to the needs of us. That's one of the reasons for the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. You can, you know, through your mind's eye, you can almost see his disciples just almost on the edge of their seat as he's speaking to them in Luke 10, starting in verse 25. They see the, the lawyer coming up to Christ and saying, and, and, and beginning the conversation with him. Jesus tells him to love God with your heart, soul, and mind, and, he, and your neighbor is yourself. And he asks, who is my neighbor? They look at him, and then they look back at Christ, and Christ tells that, that wonderful parable. They're learning. They're learning from their master. And Jesus said to them in Matthew 20 and 28, For even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. And he showed them what he meant in John chapter 13 when he takes out that wash basin and he starts washing their feet and then he tells them, I've given you an example that you should do to others as I have done unto you. They got it. They learned from that example. That's what they taught other people. That's what the early church did. In Acts chapter 4, 32, the, the early Christians were of one heart and of one mind, one soul. There were those in Jerusalem who were needy, and the early Christians who had houses and lands sold them. They sold their possessions. And they took the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every, every person as they had need. But it even extended beyond the physical needs of others. It went especially 
to the spiritual needs of others. Jesus taught that as well. Paul taught and wrote the Galatians in Galatians 6, starting with verse 1. He said, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. When one slips away, when a brother or sister falls away, what do the faithful do? We're to go after them. We're to go plead with them and talk with them and try and teach them, try to bring them back. In Galatians 6, 2, Paul said, Bear one another's burdens. Bear one, another, uh, one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, Paul said, writing to the, to the, Corinth, to the, uh, to the Romans, if one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Weep with those who weep. Rejoice with those who rejoice. In 1 Corinthians 12, 25, he said the members of the body are to have the same care one for another. Love each other. Be concerned about one another. Serve each other. The door of service. If we do all of this, then finally there's one more door that's going to be opened. The door of heaven. Heaven will be our home. And as we stand before the Lord, having faithfully served, having lived a faithful Christ-like life, then we'll hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. Enter thou into the joys of thy Lord. Indescribable joy as we're ushered into our new home, the majestic city of God, there to live, to live with God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, the angelic host of heaven, the redeemed of the ages throughout all of eternity because we came through those doors of opportunity that the Lord provided for us. If you're not a Christian, the Lord's invitation is to obey. Come unto me, all ye that labor. How do you come to Christ? Well, here again, as we noted a few moments ago, the scriptures are very plain. In Acts chapter 2, when the gospel was preached, you know you have so many things taught in religion today. So many things. People are told to say, a, to say a sinner's prayer. You know, it would surprise, I'm sure, a lot of people to learn that there's no example in the scriptures of a sinner's prayer. There's not any. In Acts chapter 2, on the first day of the church, when people said, what shall we do? Peter didn't tell them that. He didn't tell them you need to ask the Lord to come into your heart. He didn't tell them to receive Jesus as your personal Savior. They said, what shall we do? And then Peter says, repent and be baptized every one of you. By whose authority? In the name of Jesus Christ. For what purpose? For the remission of sins. And those who gladly received his word did just that. And that's what you need to do. If you're an unfaithful child of God, come back home to the Lord. Repent of whatever sin may be in your life. Pray God asking his forgiveness. As together we stand.